In ancient Japan, there was a time when two distinctive cultures of people resided over the land. Those of the Yamato Kingdom, a people who carried the traditions and customs present in China and Korea, who ruled over the southern portions of the islands, and that of the Emishi, a rugged and shamanistic people who lived to the north. For hundreds of years, the early people of the Japanese islands had lived together in relative peace with one another. That is, until the 7th century, when these two groups fell into a period of bitter conflict, as the influence of the Yamato Kingdom had begun pushing northward. And although many Emishi tribes saw fit to integrate themselves into Yamato society, others fiercely resisted, launching aggressive attacks against the Yamato border. War was on the horizon, and finally, by 773 AD, what is known as the 38 Years' War begun between the Yamato and the remaining hostile Emishi tribes. Initially, the Emishi would see great victories against the poorly disciplined Yamato conscript armies. But soon, a shift would come as the success of a mounted warrior people from the Kanto Plain began to take prominence. These were the Bushi. Through the rise of this new warrior group, the Amishi would be driven back until finally being considered defeated by 811. With their territory lost and many of their people either dead, exiled, or integrated into the new flourishing Japanese Yamato society, the old Amishi people and culture faded away into legend. While the Bushi, who had been so instrumental in winning the war for the Yamato, would soon evolve into the samurai warrior class. Over the coming centuries, much change would come to Japan as the samurai grew powerful and would come to seize the reins of the country for themselves. It is here, after 500 years, we enter into the Muromachi period when the Ashikaga Shogunate, a samurai military government, now ruled from the capital Kyoto. It is here, Hayao Miyazaki chose to set his story about the last Emishi prince and his journey to the west. We don't really know what happened to the last true Emishi. While there were those who had chosen to integrate themselves into Yamato society, and others who had fled into Hokkaido, it is hard to believe that any pockets of Emishi people would have still remained hidden and independent on the main island of Honshu. Yet, it is not completely out of the realm of possibility. It is this idea, this concept, that there was still a last surviving tribe of the Amishi people, which Hayao Miyazaki chose to start his riveting tale of Ashitaka. For centuries, they must have lived in secrecy and seclusion, with likely little to no idea of the developments of the rest of Japan. They had not seen the rise of the samurai, the birth of the Kamakura shogunate, or its demise. They perhaps even had little knowledge of the petty wars and squabbles between samurai families that occasionally arose across the country. Whatever the case, the last of the Amishi would never be able to keep themselves free of outside influence forever. We do not know when, specifically, Miyazaki chose to set the story of Princess Mononoke, but we do know for sure that it takes place during the Muromachi period during the age when the Ashikaga shoguns ruled from Kyoto. We know this because it is told to us that 500 years prior, the Emishi had been defeated. But additionally, in the Japanese version of the film, which I highly recommend watching over the English version, much more detail into the history and state of Japan at this time is given. In this version, we hear that not only does the power of the emperor fade, but also that the fangs of his shoguns are broken. This is a clear indicator that this film likely takes place after the Onin War. Yet, there are also later indications in the film that point to it being set before the 1540s. Because of this, an argument can be made that the story is set during the early years of the Sengoku Jidai, Japan's age of warring clans, when samurai families all across the country fought over regional power, throwing Japan into a bitter state of conflict and chaos. It was a time when war bred war, and when hatred gripped the land. In fact, hatred itself is perhaps one of, if not the largest theme in the story. Hatred, and what hate not only forces us to do, but also what our hate can cause. This is why, that within the very name of the film, and one of its most central characters, 
the word Mononoke is used, as a Mononoke was a vengeful spirit. Now, spirits, gods, and demons are all present in this film, as it is not straight historical fiction, but also fantasy. And how these spirits connect to the story and what they each mean in Japanese folklore would be a separate video entirely. This is where, if you want to learn more about the mythology in the film, I recommend watching the videos both Story Dive and Linfamy did a while ago. I'll leave a link to them down below. But rather, what I want to focus on here is the period, the story, and central theme of a land in turmoil with the hate it spawned and the destruction it wrought. In this, Hayao Miyazaki's 1997 masterpiece, Princess Mononoke. It is here, in Miyazaki's only film set in feudal Japan to date, he paints a real world yet with living connections to Japanese mythology. This is seen through the many spirits that appear as guardians over the forests. Boar gods, ape gods, wolf gods, and even the very spirit of the forest itself, along with the many Kodama children of the forest. It is these spirits that the world of men have come to fear, as in the way of war and expansion, the spirits have sought violence against those who would seek to cut down the forests and harm nature's sacred land. Yet while most of Japan have become fearful of these ancient gods, the last of the Amishi continue to try and live in harmony with the spirits. That is, until a boar god named Nago, a spirit from far to the west, wounded and deranged, wandered towards the village of the last Amishi tribe. Nago had been shot and had let fear and hatred consume him. In the end, he would be brought down by Ashitaka, the last prince of the Amishi. Yet in doing so, his arm would be infected by the beast's corruption. With no other option, Ashitaka would be forced to leave his village and journey west from whence the spirit came, in search of what caused its pain, and perhaps even heal his own wound before it kills him as well. This is where, through Ashitaka's eyes, we journey into Sengoku, Japan, where war grips the land. With battles erupting and massacres taking place, it is an age of lawlessness and destruction, yet there are still beacons of hope. Eventually, we discover Iron Town, a revolutionary place where the stalwart Lady Iboshi has established a society of her own, separate from the samurai world around them, which has engulfed the world in strife. We see that she has immense benevolence towards the common people she cares after, buying up prostitutes from brothels and bandaging lepers. She runs Iron Town like a form of commune, where all are given work and purpose, and in turn, all are free and protected. It is an ideal society sitting in an ocean of injustice and suffering, and she and her people are able to achieve this oasis through the rising power of firearms, specifically Chinese hand cannons. Historically, these early firearms had arrived in Japan as early as the 13th century, Yet, they were unreliable, and thus were not always favored over more traditional ranged weaponry like the bow and arrow. And although in the film, Lady Iboshi is trying to advance her firearm technology further, it is clear that this is all set before the arrival of Western firearms with the Portuguese, who would first come to Japan in 1543. Through the usage of these powerful weapons, Lady Iboshi has been able to hold off hostile samurai clans and ensure the safety of Iron Town. Yet, this has also come at the expense of the spirits of the forest. As Iron Town expands and digs deep for more metal with which to produce more guns, they cut more and more into the forest. It is here they angered the great boar god Nago. Yet, through the power of Lady Eboshi and her hand cannons, they were able to wound the boar and send it fleeing to where it would eventually arrive at Ashitaka's village. One of the central driving forces behind Ashitaka himself in his journey to the west is to see with eyes unclouded. To see the outside world and what has become of the land since his people were defeated centuries ago. To see what had harmed the boar god Nago that in turn now cursed himself. And through his travels, he sees very little redeeming qualities in the outside world. Instead, finding only greed, hate, and arrogance specifically on the part of Lady Iboshi. She is someone with an admirable goal, yet in pursuit of escaping the world of war that surrounds them, she has instead turned her guns on the very spirits of the land, sending them into rage against her and the people she's trying to protect. Now they seek death to the humans, 
and wish to destroy Iron Town just as other samurai clans seek to do as well. Ashitaka, upon visiting Iron Town and speaking with Lady Iboshi, finds himself in a conflicted position. He sees the good Lady Iboshi has done, but cannot forgive her for her crimes against the spirits of the forest. But this is where we finally meet Princess Mononoke herself, a human girl abandoned by her family and thrown at the feet of the wolf god Moro, but instead taken in and raised by them as one of their own. Mononoke, also called San, is too a conflicted character, being human by nature but raised by the wolf god and made princess of the spirits. Like her name Mononoke suggests, she has sworn vengeance against the humans for their desecration of the forest and harming of its spirits. Both Ashitaka and San are really two different sides of the same coin, yet while San has let hatred for humanity consume her, Ashitaka still believes there is hope for peace between men and spirits. A foolish hope, as we will come to see a larger plot unraveled to kill the very spirit of the forest, a task the Emperor himself has ordered done so that he can take its head and use it to gain immortality. We never see the Emperor in Princess Mononoke, but only hear about him, frequently through his loyal monk and servant Jikobo. In the Japanese version of the film, we are not only told that the Emperor's power is fading, but of course that he seeks the head of the spirit of the forest for immortality. This paints the picture of a much more active Emperor than in actual history. By this point in feudal Japan, the Emperor had little to no power, but was simply an influential leader and figurehead of the nation. Yet, with the power of immortality, perhaps he would eventually be able to amass the will to gain supreme authority once more and end the warring period. Either that, or simply live on in lavish luxury forever. We don't truly know his motives, we don't know his nature. But what we do know is that this plot to kill the spirit of the forest, whether for good intentions or otherwise, would be a very bad thing to do, as such actions could completely sever ties between humanity and the world of the spirits. Sadly, after everything, Ashitaka and San would fail to save the spirit of the forest, and the cruelty of man would win out. Still, through his last actions in preservation of the spirit of the forest, Ashitaka would be healed and would vow to help the idealistic people of Iron Town rebuild in the aftermath of the destruction its death would cause. As I alluded to earlier, Princess Mononoke is a film that masterfully tackles several major themes, man versus nature, man versus man, and man versus self. All through the central lens of a world at war and the hate that it was causing, a depiction of feudal Japan during the Sengoku Jidai that also mixes in elements of Japanese mythology and folklore to help tell a poignant story. One that is perhaps even more relevant now than it was back when it was released in 1997, as it portrays the destruction of our environment while we are in pursuit of our own selfish aims, never able to see past the immediate future and down to the more permanent ramifications of the devastation that will come. It is an important lesson that humanity has largely still yet to learn. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most interesting.